Hare Krishna. Okay. What time tonight? Six four five. It's it starts. Then getting there six thirty. Just leave here six thirty. Okay. Jai Radha. Madhava Kunja Bihari Madhava Kunja Bihari
This is Canto 10, Chapter 39, Korah's Vision, and this is verses 17 through 21, okay? Katim sulalitam chestam Snigdahasavalokanam Sokapahani Narmani Prodamacharitani Cha Katim Sulalitam Chestam Snigdahasavalokanam Sokapahani Narmani Pradama Charitani Cha Katim Sulalitam Chastam Sigmahasa Valokanam Sukapahani Narmani Pradama Charitani Cha Thank you. 
Ladies? <laughs> Activities, snigda, affectionate, hasa, smiling, avalokanam, the glances, shoka, unhappiness, apahani, which remove, normani, the joking words, pradama. Mighty, Charitani, the deeds, Cha, and Chintayatya, thinking about Mukundasya of Lord Krishna, Vita, afraid, Viraha, because of separation. Kartara, greatly distressed, Sameta, joining together, Sangasa, in groups, Prochu, they spoke, Asru, with tears, Mukya, their faces, Achuta Asaya, their minds absorbed in Lord Achuta. Translation The gopis were frightened at the prospect of even the briefest separation from Lord Mukunda. So now, as they remembered his, his graceful gait, his pastimes, his affection, his smiling glances, his heroic deeds and joking words, which would relieve their distress, they were besides themselves with anxiety at the thought of the great separation about to come. They gathered in groups and spoke to one another, their faces covered with tears and their minds fully absorbed in Achutya, Achuta. Verse number 19, the Gopi said, O Providence, you have no mercy. You bring in body creatures together in friendship and love and then senselessly separate them before they can fulfill their desires. This whimsical play of yours is like a child's game. Hmm. Having shown us Mukunda's face, framed by dark, lock, dark locks and beautiful, beautified by his fine cheeks, raised nose and gentle smiles, which eradicate all misery, you are now making that face invisible. This behavior of yours is not at all good. O province, though you come here with the name Akura, you are indeed cruel. For like a fool, you take away what you once gave us, those eyes which, which we have seen, even in one feature of Lord Madhudwish's form, the perfection of your entire creation. Srila Prabhupada's, I mean, sorry, the disciples of Srila Prabhupada's purport. The gopis did not care to see anything but Krishna. Therefore, if Krishna left Vrindavan, their eyes would have no function. Thus, Krishna's departure was blinding these poor girls, and in their distress, they berated Akura, whose name means not cruel, 
as cruel indeed. Om Gyan Timirandas Yagyana Jana Salakaya Chaksu Unmilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Vistam Staptitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadam Mayam Dadati Swam Padati Kam Ma Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Shri Bhakti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gorvani Pacharine Nirvisesa Sunyavadi Pastyatya De Sitarine Panchakopa Tarubhischa Kripa Sindhu Bevacha Titanam Bhave Bhyo Vaishnave Bhyo Namaho Namaha Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sivasari Gaur Bhakta Rinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Yela Prabhupada Ki Jai So we're hearing about the gopis in their anticipation of Krishna's separation. The separation from Krishna and the anticipation from the separation of Krishna is the same for the gopis. <laughs> you wouldn't think that the anticipation and the separation is the same, but they have experienced that separation before and they understand the pain it gives them. The gopis have pure love for Krishna and their love is absorbed in serving Krishna continuously. We might use the word 24-7 to give a clear understanding of their absorption in Krishna. Uh, when love reaches such a state of, of perfection, you can't do anything else but want to be with and serve the object of love. Uh, Love is the, is the emotion that is the perfection of life. To exchange love, to give love, to receive love is the goal of life. And Krishna is the object of that love because there's no, there's no perfect love anywhere to be found but within Krishna. What goes on in this material world as love, as Srila Prabhupada would offer, uh, explain is not really love, it's it goes on the name of individual desires for personal gratification. Using the other person as the object of, of uh, getting that satisfaction. Well, that is not love, that is more like business, or we, to use the word, it's called karma or, or lust. <laughs> love has no, um, what we say, expectations. Love is simply giving. When we expect something from what we give, then it becomes less than what it is. Of course, in the material world, that expectation is there because otherwise people don't develop relationships because there is some agreement or some expectation that is there in a preliminary sense which allows that relationship to begin and then ultimately to develop. But with Krishna, it's not like that. Krishna leaves and the gopis' love is never lost or even diminished even a, a bit. You see, in the material world, also, people have a loving relationship with someone dear to them. If that person departs, for some time that, that love continues and that anxiety of wanting that person to return becomes stronger and stronger. But then, if it goes on for an extended period of time, we see by experience, that people lose that because they're thinking, well, you know, I'm not gonna, that person's not coming back or to take, and so they try to replace that, um, that feeling towards that object by replacing the object itself. <laughs> in other words, another person. So in the, in the material world, it's still, although the, the mood is similar, it is still tinged with personal desire. But the gopis, it looks like, they're, it looks like they're, you know, lamenting about their own fate. You know, they're just thinking, oh, how will we live? You know, it's, 
but that's seen in a in a wrong way. They know that their love for Krishna is is perfect, and they want to satisfy Krishna always. And they know that there's no one that can satisfy Krishna like they do. So they want to give Krishna the ultimate perfection of happiness at all times through the experience through the experience of their love for him. And Krishna he's always there to receive that, but sometimes in order to uh, increase that anxiety of wanting to love him, he departs. <laughs> And this is the highest form of uh, bhakti, a love and separation. Because, and of course, in, we, uh, we hear that actually Krishna never leaves Vrindavan. He's always there. So he's there in the mood of vipralamba bhav, which is the mood of separation. He's always in the hearts of the residents of Vrindavan. They can never leave his association. And because Krishna is not relegated to you know, a particular place. In other words, to be with Krishna, you you don't have to be with him personally. You can be with him in the mood of loving him, and that is just as good as being with him, because Krishna is on the spiritual platform, not on the material platform, where everything it has to be done according to proximity, place, where you can love Krishna, and even though he's not personally present, that love or that relationship, or that association, that's a better word, that association, is still as good as what it is if you were personally present. So Krishna appears to be gone, but he's not. <laughs> he stays within the heart of his devotees, who increase their intensity of their love for him. And you'll see, as this particular series of verses, uh, chapters goes on, how Krishna, he, he wants to satisfy the gopis' desire to, for him to be with them. So he sends a kura, that'll come up in the later chapters, to Vrindavan, to somehow or other pacify the gopis by reminding them of Krishna's love for them. And he's doing a pretty good job <laughs> for a while. But then the gopis, after a while, they don't want to hear it anymore. They want Krishna. <laughs> he does. He's he he looks like Krishna too, and because he looks like Krishna, they're they're really happy to be with him and hear about Krishna. But at the same time, it's not the same. <laughs> so you can't really intellectualize or understand this mood of love because it's an experience. It's not something you can you know, write down on a piece of paper and try to, you know, uh, understand it. So the gopis love her. And the example that's given, which is the epitome of all examples, is that uh, one time Krishna had a headache. And uh, so Narada Muni happened to be with Krishna at the time. So Krishna, Narada had asked Krishna, how are you? Krishna said, well, I have a headache. Oh, you have a headache? Mm, what can we do? Well, there's only one remedy for my headache, and that is the dust of the feet of my devotees. When I place that on my head, then my headache is gone. Narada said, that's impossible. Who's going to give you their foot dust? <laughs> And Krishna said, that's okay, go around and maybe you can find someone. And so he goes first to the sages of Nami Sharanya Forest. Uh, and uh, he meets them. He's, he's on a mission to get the dust. And uh, they greet Narada very nicely, worship him, glorify him. They're so happy to be with him. And then uh, Narada they ask, well, Narada, you know, you've come for some reason. Yes, what is that? Well, Krishna has a headache. The sun is right in your eyes. Huh? You can switch over a little bit, maybe. You look quite effulgent with the sun. <laughs> Gives you more effulgence. <laughs> yeah, and the sun does that. <laughs> 
Sun is very merciful, it shares its effulgence with others. <laughs> And so they're asking, you know, why have you come, Narada? And he said, well, you know, Krishna's got a headache. Oh, phew, they become distressed. What can we do? Is there anything? He said, yes, that's why I've come. He says, the only thing that can cure his headache is the dust from your feet. And all of a sudden, everything changes. They don't want to hear that. Narada, what are you talking about? Where did you get this from? The dust of our feet? on the head of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, you know, that's so offensive and we'll go to hell for that. So forget it, don't even ask again. <laughs> so Narada could understand that they weren't going to do anything. So he left and he went to a few other devotees and they all gave the same answer. And finally he came back to Krishna and said, mission un unfulfilled, <laughs> I failed. Krishna said, don't worry, go to Vrindavan and ask the gopis. And so now he's excited to get the association of the gopis. So Narada leaves and he gets there really quick. He's, he can travel fast. He's a spaceman. So he gets to Vrindavan and they welcome Narada. They know Narada and they offer nice prayers to Narada and, and uh, ask Narada to bless them. And then they ask, well, why have you come? Well, Krishna has a headache. Oh my, the gopis almost died when they heard that. <laughs> the pain of hearing that Krishna had a headache was just too much. That's how much their love for Krishna is. In fact, you hear sometimes when Krishna walks in the forest, he walks on these twigs and these little pebbles that are covering the areas of Vrindavan. And the gopis, when they think about that, they just become distressful. Krishna's soft lotus feet are being pricked and being scratched by these rocks and twigs and it's too much for their mind to, to accept. They become really distressed. And so now they said, well, what can we do? Well, he wants the dust from your feet. So immediately they start taking their bangles off and they're scraping the dust and they're making piles. Narada, come on, take the dust. And Narada decides to test them just to see. He said, well, you know, putting your dust on the foot and the head of the, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, you know, you can go to hell. They said, we don't mind. We'll go to hell forever if it relieves Krishna's headache. So don't even ask. <laughs> just take the dust. So Krishna goes, and Narada goes back and then he explains to Krishna. Yeah, and then Krishna wanted to show Narada that this is this is real this is bhakti in its best from the that complete selflessness without any individual concern for only for the benefit of and that is what that is the highest form of bhakti. That is the ultimate principle of bhakti. Complete unalloy devotion, it's called ananya bhakti, that, that bhakti which has not even a, a tinge or a slight even trace of anything selfish or personal. And now, but when people hear about the gopis, they, and they hear about how they're acting, it looks like they're kind of acting like selfish. You know, we want Krishna, why can't he, he can't stay, you know, Kuru has come, he's a, he's a rascal. They give him, they call him all kinds of names. <laughs> and they say he's not Kurura, he's not a Kurura, he's Kurura, which means he's cruel. <laughs> they start cursing him. In fact, later on, we found out that actually he did get cursed by the gopis. And because of that, he got involved with some bad association and he committed a great offense. And because of that, he was even afraid of Krishna. And that, that's played out later with the, the story of the Saman Chaka duel, which comes up in, I think, in, the, in about 10 more chapters. You'll find that's interesting. So the gopis cursed him because you know why they cursed him? Not because he took Krishna out, but because he didn't say anything to them. He didn't say, my dear gopis, you know, um, you know, I'm sorry I have to do this. 
but this is Krishna's desire and this is you know in other words he didn't try to pacify them in any way he simply acted as the charioteer and took Krishna away and the gopis are really 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 upset <laughs> with him but we get a little insight of, um, of what is real bhakti when we study the lives of the gopis that's why Prabhupada said we should take time to read we cannot imitate this level of bhakti because you, it's not possible to imitate it. It's something that comes by way of one's devotional progress. It's not something that comes by imitation. And there's a difference. When you move in a certain direction, you gain, you know, you're gaining realization, you're gaining the element of devotion. So it'll come as that devotional energy increases. And then you can start to not only understand, but also experience a little bit of this selfless bhakti. But to imitate, you know, there are people who like to imitate, Prabhupada said, there's one lady, she was telling me, or she actually wrote a book. She said, oh, um, last night, Krishna came and he was pulling on my sari. <laughs> Prabhupada said, you know, why would Krishna come and pull on her sari? <laughs> She's like thinking that, uh, you know, that this is bhakti, but you know, she's imagining these things. So people pretentiously surreptitiously they, they get into these imaginations about them about their devotion to the Lord but devotion to the Lord is has substance it's an experience it's not simply an intellectual gymnastic that you apply therefore we can study and hear about and appreciate the love that the gopis had because then you this is the highest form of bhakti and of course, within the gopis, the highest form of bhakti is Radharani's love for Krishna. And that will come up in one chapter called Brahmar Gita, which is the song of the bee. When Radharani meets Krishna in the form of a bee. <laughs> and that's a nice exchange <clears throat> that's coming up in the later chapters. But Akrura is doing his, he's doing his service, he's accepting the, the criticism that goes along with doing the service. Sometimes it's like that, you have to do your service. And so for some reason, you're being criticized for doing whatever you're doing. You know it's right, it's being sanctioned like that. But at the same time, other people don't understand, find some fault or criticize. But and that happens because no matter what you do in this world you'll find people always find fault with that there's somebody who will find fault with every, anything you do no matter what it is and that's the nature of Kali Yuga it's just you know Kali Dosha Niti it's just an ocean of faults and one of the biggest faults is criticism everybody criticized Prabhupada was saying I was just listening yesterday Prabhupada said criticism goes on all the time in Kali Yuga everyone is criticizing everybody people criticize they even criticize themselves too <laughs> well that's good because that helps you to become a little bit more you know uh, uh, aware of your own deficiencies but criticism are going on so this is the nature of Kali Yuga. So, but when we have to do our duty or, or when we have to engage in devotional service and we're following the instructions of the spiritual master, then it doesn't matter you know, what people say because we know that everything we do is ordained by the Supreme Personality of Godhead. As long as we are doing it, in the proper way. Proper way means proper mood and according to the activities that it meant to be performed in that way. Everything should be done in the right way and in the right mood. The right mood 
in the mood of service and in the right way according to how that activity is meant to be performed. Yeah. It's like you have a construction business, but you have, might have a nice mood about, well, I'm going to build this nice building, but some of your workers don't know how to do it, so it doesn't work so good. <laughs> they make mistakes, and then, and then, you know, you have to start all over again, and then it wastes time, it wastes energy, it wastes money. So everything has to be done in the right way, in the right mood. But uh, of course. Of the two, the mood and the proper way, the mood is more important. The mood is more important because this is a this is a, a process of bhakti. Bhakti means to offer devotion to Krishna or to the Krishna's devotees by serving in such a way that you want to please those persons that you serve or to make a difference in their Krishna consciousness in a very positive way. So that's important. Uh, and if we're always conscious of what we're doing, sometimes because of the mode of passion, the mode of passion forces us to think and act without even, to, without even clearly seeing the situation. Sometimes you do something and then after a while you realize it's not right, or you said something you shouldn't have said, or you didn't say something you should have said. <laughs> it's like that. So if we're very, if we remember Krishna, this is the whole thing. By remembering Krishna, everything is perfect. Everything is perfect. So that's another process to remember Krishna, but to remember Krishna always, and of course, that's the recommend, recommendation from the acharyas, satatam kirtayanto mam, to always glorify, to rem remember Krishna, always. And that is the perfection of devotion. And that takes practice, and it also takes determination. So we need to practice that mood of always remember. The, the gopis, they can't forget Krishna. If you tell the gopis to forget Krishna, they'll think you're, to use the word, crazy. <laughs> it's not possible. Even even Prabhupada talked about himself. He said, you know, uh, yeah. Are, oh, someone asked Prabhupada, are you always remembering Krishna? Prabhupada said, I, uh, there's never a time I was not remembering Krishna. <laughs> so for a great soul such as Srila Prabhupada, you know, to remember Krishna is natural. It's ordinary. And it's, it's just the way life goes. For us, we have to make an effort to remember Krishna. And that's why we have, that's why we have association with devotees, we have the deities, we have our holy name, the prasadam, we have worship. All of these things that we perform is meant to build this consciousness of Krishna. Always, constantly, constantly. So that we can, when we're outside of the activities, say we're outside doing something else, we're still able to remember Krishna by the strength of our own performance of these activities. And so when we absorb ourselves in the day-to-day -day activities of devotion, that makes an impression on the consciousness and that carries with you. The more you absorb yourself, the more that impression, the stronger that impression becomes like that. And it becomes more natural to remember Krishna. Okay, so these are some things. This particular section is interesting because you'll see as, um, I mean, finally, Kruor gets away. The gopis do everything they can to stop the chariot. They even lay in front of the chariot, <laughs> thinking it doesn't matter if the chariot rolls over us. We'll still at least, at least we'll be able to stop Krishna <laughs> from going. Krishna is not willing to be stopped because he has a mission. And this is interesting because Krishna's mission is to give pleasure to his devotees, that's why he comes, but also to kill the demons and reestablish religion. So sometimes, not sometimes, but a lot of times in each of his leelas, he puts aside his devotees for the mission. 
He did that with Chaitanya Mahaprabhu when he took sannyas. You know, he left his devotees in order to, you know, to preach Krishna consciousness from the sannyas ashram. Sri Krishna also here, he has to kill so many demons. That's why he's leaving the Vrindavan. So he wants, he needs to fulfill that mission of getting rid of that. No one else could do it because these demons were really heavy demons, not small demons. Demons we have now, they're just like, you know, insects <laughs> compared to the demons. <laughs> these, these are really powerful demons. And uh, they cause much problems. And then, of course, even in Lord Ramachandra, you know, he had to, you know, leave Ayodhya, his home, and, you know, be separated from his devotees in order to, uh, you know, take care of Ravana. <laughs> so, yeah, you see how the Lord's mission, you know, he has to execute that, and the devotees are always feeling separation or anxiety because of the Lord's executing his mission. I can't see the clock. I don't know what time it is. Hmm? 821? Okay. So we can open it up if you have any questions or comments. Yes, uh, Leela Munchery. Maharaj, welcome back to Chicago. We are very, very fortunate to have your association. It's nice Thank to be you. here. <laughs> I was feeling yesterday, I was thinking, hmm, boy, I feel kind of natural being here. <laughs> like, I was thinking when I come back here, what, you know, what am I going to do? But uh, it seems quite natural to be here for some reason. <laughs> Maybe you can find the explanation. <laughs> Yeah, this was your home for several, several years. Yeah, 1995 to 2012 or 13, I'm not sure, one of those years. Yeah, they used to call me the, the non-resident resident. <laughs> the resident that's never here. <laughs> Yeah, what to do? <laughs> question. Yes, my, my question was that um, throughout scriptures we often find this a, a lot of emphasis on what, committing Vaishnava Parat and how it affects our spiritual life. So as you were explaining um, the curse of the gopis to Akrura, I was thinking about um, how the um, how uh, Rupa Goswami was once in meditation and his meditation broke because he um, um, in his meditation he smiled and um, Ashtavakra he took offense thinking that he was smiling at him passing by and walking mm -hmm. and I was also thinking about like Akrura he was a devotee of the Lord but um, he was bound by duty and he wanted Krishna to come to Mathura. But in both ways, like, it, it seems that their devotion was affected uh, because of their, um, because of what they did. And um, it, it's, it was unintentional um, f in the first case. Like, so I'm thinking about myself, and sometimes I have uh, spoken honestly about you have certain things. You have I, to what? I have spoken honestly. Spoken, okay. Honestly about some perspective or some devotee. Um, and they have taken offense um, to it. So, like, I'm trying to understand, like, where do we draw the line? about being honest and like receiving a reaction for it mm. well mm -hmm. 
Speaking honestly is not necessarily simply telling things the way they are. It's also how you present that knowledge. Satyam priyam, satyam buyam, to speak the truth in a palatable way. <laughs> and there's many examples of Prabhupada, especially the story of Vallabhacharya, which is a very long story. But, uh, yeah, I think you have to be sensitive to the possibility that what you say may not be, at least be aware, and it may not be accepted, and you'll be seen as something else. Uh, it depends on your relationship with the person also. In some cases, like the, the spiritual master must do that to the disciples, the teachers must do that to the students, the parents must do that for their children, because they have that role to play, and that's their responsibility. Unless you have that role, then if you want to walk into a role, then it becomes a then it becomes a whole different thing. Are you the one to, to, to speak it? <laughs> and then you have to see. You have to you have to kind of perceive a little bit about what may happen by what you say for him. Uh, beforehand, before you even say something. Um, the reactions are not in our, within our control. Yeah. The reactions come from, you know, higher powers. So we have to be a little sensitive and see. Be a little fore foresight to see whether this is ne necessary or not necessary, or not necessary at the particular time. It's a very complex situation where, but I think a little bit of foresight in the matter of what will be the outcome, you can try to perceive that before you enter into the activity. Yeah, because a lot of times people don't understand or if they misunderstand they take they take that misunderstanding in as an offense I think I gave did I talk about that the other day about misunderstanding about the two boys that went with Prabhupada yeah both of them were right but because there was a, a misunderstanding, a lack of communication, it appeared there was, you know, there was some discrepancy in the whole activity. Uh, individual relationships are very hard to play out, but the most important thing is you have to see if you're going to instruct someone, what is your role? If you have that role, then that's one thing. If you don't have that role, then you have to be seeing what is the motivation behind you're instructing that person. Why am I doing it? Because they're disturbing me? Well, that's another thing. <laughs> because if they're disturbing the mood, then, then that, that's even more important than if it's disturbing me. In other words, just like if somebody's causing some disturbance in the temple, you know, somebody should say something because it causes problems with everybody, you know, not just the persons who feel disturbed, but other people also. So you have to see what is your role in that, in that, in that instructions. And if you feel all right, then, then you feel like you should go ahead, then you have to be very sensitive on how you present it. Better to speak in a positive way than speak in a negative way. Rather than telling people what they sh doing wrong, explain to them what they should be doing right. <laughs> That's another way of saying the same thing. <laughs> by emphasizing what is correct rather than 
emphasizing what is incorrect. When you emphasize what is correct, then the message is whatever I'm doing is incorrect. And they come by, they come, they become aware of that by themselves. Sometimes you use an example to help bring out what you're trying to say. So these are just ways to approach the situation. But if you see that by your saying it's going to disturb the whole situation, better to not do it, or to have someone else do it who you think would be more, you know, successful. Instructing others is a whole, it's a very complex and very sensitive thing. Mm -hmm. Especially when you, when you instruct children, that's one thing, but when you're instructing adults, that's a whole different thing. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Maharaj. It was very, very helpful. Mm -hmm. Does that help? Yeah. I just thought of an incident where Prabhupada was talking about, he said, you know, we are known as shaven-headed, we're not known as long-hair-headed. <laughs> and so now we're seeing that because we are very lenient, this is, this is the class he's giving, we are living lean, lean, lenient, all of these things are coming back now, all these wrong things. And he said, but I'm an old man, and you are a young man, and I cannot instruct you. But please, you know, try to remain, um, try to, you know, follow by remaining, you know, once a month, shave up, he said, like, well, once a fortnight, he said like that. So, so Prabhupada very sensitively explained how the devotees were not, you know, shaving up when they should have been. But he did it in a very sweet way. <laughs> You can listen to the tape. It's in Srimad Bhagavatam, 5th Canto, 6th chapter, verse number 3. It's in Srimad Bhagavatam, class 1976. 5, 5th Canto, 6th chapter, verse 33. And Prabhupada starts talking about that. So he does it in a very nice way. That you can't not, you can't find fault with, with the way he's saying it. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes Prabhupada would get angry and he said, I'm getting old. When you get old, you get less tolerant. <laughs> so, you know, he was he was giving excuses for himself getting angry. And, you know, when you get old, you get less tolerant. <laughs> It makes the devotees feel a little bit better. You know? <laughs> but then other times he would just like, you know, just put somebody on the floor and they couldn't move. <laughs> it's like... One devotee asked Prabhupada, he was a preacher, and probably he said, you know, the Krishnas say, the Christians say, the Christians say that... Uh, um, let's see. How do you, you say that God is in the heart? So the Christians say, how do we, how do we understand that? How do we know? So Prabhupada said, you're out there preaching and you don't know the answer to that? <laughs> don't you read my books? <laughs> And uh, he was just kept going and going. The poor devotee was like sinking into the floor. And Prabhupada was just firing on him. And the other devotees who were there, they were feeling sorry for this devotee. <laughs> so they kept trying to interrupt Prabhupada just to take the pressure off this other devotee. And Prabhupada just ignored them <laughs> and just kept going for 20 minutes. I was just talking to Pallad Nanda Maharaj because he was there during this situation. He was he was there when this was happening. He was and you know, he was telling me all the details. 
And you know that devotee just went, whoa. <laughs> Prabhupada just kept firing on him. You don't read my books, you know. You're out there preaching. How are you, how are you going to be able to preach if you don't know the, the answer? <laughs> so sometimes Prabhupada would make you feel so little, and then, but the next minute, there was no anger with Prabhupada. He was just like back to normal because he could turn it on and turn it off. So if you get if you get upset when you're ex when you're uh, chastising or constructing someone that's you know then you have to be able to control that we should not be controlled by our emotions but we should be able to control our emotions <laughs> that's the point <laughs> emotions are strong and sometimes people get carried away by the emotional moment and do and say things that and they later regret tremendously. <laughs> okay, any other comments, questions? Yes, Jai Valadev. No, no, I was just passing around first. Ruchi. Thank you, Maharaj, for the nice class. So uh, there's a quote that I heard that uh, society creates criminals and the criminals just commit the act. So if a, a demon loves Krishna or is trying to love Krishna, is, a demon. Going, yeah, is Krishna going to reciprocate accordingly, seeing the past of the demon, what he has gone through? Krishna, if a demon is trying to change and actually become a devotee by loving Krishna, Krishna will accept that. He will not see your past. He will simply accept with you whatever you're offering. Krishna is like that. He's very forgiving by nature. <clears throat> but, you know... Mm -hmm. How Krishna deals with people is that he deals with them as they approach him. So someone, even if it's a demon approaching him in a loving mood, he's going to reciprocate in that same loving mood. But if it's a devotee approaching him in a, in a wrong mood, he'll reciprocate in that mood also. That's Krishna. Okay. All right. So anything else? Oh, there's another question over there. We have uh, Chitendriya Prabhu. I was just reading in Srila Prabhupada's book, uh, Journey to Self-Discovery. And Prabhupada, you know, stresses, uh, you know, abandon all varieties of religion and just surrender unto me. And which is, you know, part, I think that's part of the, it was at the 18th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita? 1866, yeah. Yeah. So, but going up to that, he was saying, give up all this nonsense, uh, Christian, Jewish, Muslim, you know, like whatever you're following. And then, you know, but I don't think people were quite ready because they're, they're in their traditions and they can't really just change like that, you know, because they, they have to evaluate uh, the whole spectrum. But they don't understand what Prabhupada's saying. Right. Yeah. He's not saying giving up your your devotional path. He's giving up give up the idea that you that 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 you are designated in that way. You're not a Christian. You're not a Jew. You're following a particular path that's given us a particular name. That's all. Yeah. Well, we are Jivar Sarupai Krishna and Nichidas. <coughs> That's our identity. That's everyone's identity. And so when we identify ourselves with the way we practice as opposed to our, our actual uh, our real identity, our internal identity, yeah. then that is, that's, that's off. Like, if a person thinks, well, I'm a temple president. Well, you're playing the role of a temple president. It doesn't mean you're a temple president. <laughs> you play the role. 
you were temple president in that role, but who are you? You are, you know, Krishna's part and parcel. I'm a guru. Prabhupada said, anyone, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati said, anyone who thinks he's a guru is a gomu, cow, <laughs> an animal. <laughs> so he used, these, you know, if we identify with the roles we play, as opposed to identifying with who we really are, then that's that's the that's the dichotomy. Yeah. Another thing, when Prabhupada was in uh, the Evanston Temple, he said that women are less intelligent than men, and that kind of really was uh, a startling statement for you know the certain women to you know comprehend that. No, women are more intelligent than men because they can control men. That's that's obvious, you know. So that's the end of that. <laughs> yeah, I just yeah, that's that. that's logical, right? Uh -huh. they, yeah. That was a pretty controversial thing at the time. Well, they don't understand the statement in context. That's all. Jai Baladev, you got a question? Yeah, thank you for your class. Um, just a small comment. I, um, I appreciate when the sannyasis, any sannyasi comes, because all the devotees are definitely well more behaved, including myself. Um, and I think Leela Mandri has nothing to worry about. Usually when the sannyasis leave, I'm screaming at all the devotees. So compared to me, I think I commit the most apparatus. <laughs> So, um, but my question is regarding your point of proximity. Proximity. You mentioned this word, proximity. Yeah, within the within the range of association. Yeah. And um, immediately this brought to mind um, that Prabhupada always makes a distinction between um, proximity and principles, or the vapu versus the vani of the spiritual mass. And the vani, the principles, the instructions are more important. And so there's a, one of my favorite pastimes in the Srila Prabhupada, Levamrita. This is from um, Levamrita chapter 34. The chapter is called um, Jet H. Padibhaja Kacharya. Yeah. And so in that chapter, there was a temple president named Hadi Vilas Prabhu. And for whatever reason, him and another a devotee, a teenager, I believe, his name was Ganesham, they came in late to a Prabhupada lecture. So they both came, the temple president and Ganesham, who's translating some of Prabhupada's books, came in late. And so Hari Bhakti Vilas, he's explaining that when I came in late to the lecture of Prabhupada, Ganesham, he sat all the way in the back. But Hari Vilas Prabhu, he says, I walked all the way to the front and sat right next to Prabhupada. And he says, at that moment, Prabhupada gave me my first instruction. And Prabhupada's first instruction was to him, is that he said Prabhupada didn't even acknowledge me. Prabhupada didn't acknowledge me. He ignored me. And so, this is one thing I appreciate because um, Prabhupada says in the seventh canto, chapter 5, verse 12, he says that one should not be proud of one's own service. One should appreciate the service of others. So my question is, is that um, what are some steps we could do to, or at least this is a lesson I appreciate from Prabhupada that um, the tendency you says in the material world, everyone has their motive. So when we appreciate something, it's either you did a good job, but it's followed by a but, or you did a good job because I need something for you. So how important is it to offer, every day is an opportunity to offer appreciation devotees without yeah. expecting anything in return. So how important is it to offer that appreciation without expecting anything, without any correction? Well, it should be done genuinely, not not pretentiously. <clears throat> well, you know, if we if we don't appreciate the other devotees, then how can you actually, you know, associate with them? <laughs> you appreciate because they're a devotee, that's the main thing. And the second thing is that they're exhibiting certain qualities in their devotional service. Or they're also doing certain activities that we we find are very beneficial. We can appreciate that because it also helps us. You know, it's not like it's distinct from our benefit. We get benefit 
by another person's service, you know. So we can appreciate that. And some of our gotras, when we have these big programs, one of the parts of the yatra towards the end is to spend about a half hour to an hour just naming the devotees who work so hard to put on the yatra to you know the cooks or the organizers the kirtan eaters whoever just to appreciate what services they've done and this is good for the devotees it makes them feel inspired to do more yeah but then again the uh, the wrong way to do it is just to go around just just being an, a, what they call a professional appreciator <laughs> I appreciate you because I want you to be I want to be known as a person who appreciates <laughs> that's another one a professional appreciator it says all good things, but it's just a program. It's not really coming from the heart. But if you reflect and you genuinely can see what is happening amongst the devotees and amongst the activities, appreciation will automatically be there. If you're not appreciating, that means you're insensitive to what's, what's happening around you. Oblivious, more like. <laughs> yeah. Yes, okay. So, Mataji, yes, you have, oh, you have a question? Yeah. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. So, it's, it's, I read somewhere that whatever devotional service we perform is it's because of some other devotees. Whatever devotional service we yeah. perform, because it's of, because of other devotees' nice. blessings also. So, it's nice you are here, Maharaj. I hope you be more here. <laughs> <laughs> so the program becomes more enlivened. Uh, thank you. Uh, okay. You explained very nicely about the gopis in different ways. The path of gopis is path of perfection. We cannot imitate that. Um, so there's somewhere it's mentioned like householders, 70-40%, brahmachari, 70%, back home, back to Godhead. The chances of going back home to Godhead. So, oh, you presented, presenting you're giving it a percentage. <laughs> no, Prabhupada says it, not me. <laughs> I'm repeating. Oh. Uh, and also he said that Brahmachari, he, he can go home back to Godhead. That's also said. Yeah. If you remain a Brahmachari. If he's a strict Brahmachari his whole life. Varasa Vyesham Tvam Takatam Papam. Yeah, yeah. There's mercy there. <clears throat> You want a quick way to go back to Godhead? I can tell you. Preach. <laughs> preach Krishna consciousness. And then that will, you know, as soon as you preach, you're recognized by Krishna automatically. And preaching, you know, people don't really want to hear it, but still, you got to do it. <laughs> yeah, Prabhupada said, so anyone who preaches, he's immediately, she's immediately recognized by the Supreme Lord. Nupi Prabhupada said, if you get recognized by the Lord, then your devotional service is guaranteed. Yeah, but if you're doing any other service, of course, you can always preach in whatever service you're doing. It's not like there is a distinct, there is a distinct service called preachers, but but everyone can have the mood of preaching and find opportunities to spread Krishna consciousness no matter what your service is. <clears throat> but it's something you have to desire. If you don't desire it, it won't happen. <laughs> I desire, please use me, Krishna, to be an instrument to help others to become Krishna conscious and Krishna will give you the opportunity if you pray like that and sincerely. It's not about, you know, sitting in a particular place and giving a lecture. It's about the mood of wanting to bring others closer to Krishna, that's all. <laughs> uh, 
Okay, Mataji, you have question also? Yeah, okay, okay, Hare Krishna. Um, sorry if I'm extending the time too much, but um, <clears throat> there's this um, understanding that Akura <clears throat> had actually offended the gopis um, by virtue of the fact that he hadn't. Um, in some sense, uh, spoken with them about the action he was about to perform. Uh, but on the other hand, it doesn't seem that it's completely his responsibility to do so. <laughs> Tell that to the gopis. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, um, uh, because he's coming into a setting that he's not familiar with. No, it's not, the gopis didn't say that, it's, it's, the, it's actually, I think it's either Jiva Goswami or Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur said, Kukura was implicated later on in wrong activities because he was cursed by the gopis. And what he says is that not because they, he took Krishna out, he did that, and, but because he didn't say anything to them, he just ignored them. He, didn't, he was insensitive to the fact that they were, you know, overwhelmed with, you know, separation. He didn't say anything. So it appears that he, he got an offense by omission. You can, you can get offenses by doing the wrong things, and you can get an offense by not doing the thing you're supposed to do in a certain situation. That's another kind of reaction. And what happened later on? I can tell you what happened, yeah. It's, um, I can actually, there is a particular purport. It says that, uh, yeah. He, him and Kritavarma got together and he encouraged Satyadanya to kill uh, Satyajit to steal the, the Shamantaka Juju. So he acted in that way. The Krishna forgave him after a while. Him and Krita Varma. Now Krita Varma and Akura are both pure devotees. And Krita Varma, he acted wrongly because he took the wrong association. And um, I wish I had that. And the book is not here. It's in the later chapters. I think it's in chapter 53 or something like that. Describes why he acted the way he did is because he got cursed by the gopis. <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to... That's the acharyas give us the understanding so yeah he just you know, he was just insensitive to the fact that the gopis were overwhelmed with anguish you know he's still a pure devotee though even pure devotees make mistakes Sometimes. <laughs> okay, so we'll stop here. Thank you very much. Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai. Shri Prabhupada Ki Jai.